cholesterol. Do we need cholesterol? Yes, you absolutely need cholesterol. You would, in fact, die without cholesterol. I'm Dr. Al, I'm a board certified cardiologist, and we're here to talk about cholesterol. All of the nonsense that you've heard online about cholesterol is going to be debunked right now, right here. Yes, we're going to talk about these guys, lipoproteins, what they do. We're going to talk about the absorption of cholesterol, dietary cholesterol, eating cholesterol, how your body makes cholesterol, how we can improve it, how we can get rid of it, how much is too much, how little is too much. Do you need cholesterol to make hormones? What if cholesterol is oxidized or not oxidized? Does the size of these things matter? A lot of people talk about size. Do you need damage to your arterial wall and is cholesterol just patching it up or not? That's what we're here to talk about today. So let's get started. This is going to be like a crash course in cholesterol and lipid metabolism by an actual cardiologist who looks inside your arteries. That is literally my job. So first of all, these are called lipoproteins. Lipoproteins are balls that are proteins that are filled with lipids. Inside each one of these is this yellow material that is uh, cholesterol ester, and then the turquoise is triglycerides. Um, on the outside of this is this blue marker. This blue marker, in, at least in this model, we'll call it an ApoB, an apolipoprotein B. That is what is found on most uh, cholesterol uh, lipoprotein particles. So an LDL particle has an ApoB, a VLDL, an IDL, and um, those, the chylomicrons even have B lipoproteins. An HDL has these. Let's just point to, you know, maybe this green one here. This is an ApoA1. ApoA1 is found on an HDL particle, and we'll get to the difference. Now, cholesterol in and of itself is neither good nor bad. You cannot say HDL cholesterol is good or LDL cholesterol is bad. The cholesterol in and of itself inside of an HDL or an LDL is no different. It's the same cholesterol. However, the molecule that carries it around, whether it's an ApoB, an LDL molecule, or an ApoA1, or an HDL molecule, those aren't necessarily neither good or bad either because an LDL particle, for example, part of its lifespan, it is delivering cholesterol to your arteries and dropping it off in there and destroying your arteries. But a huge part of its lifespan, um, it is connecting with an HDL, connecting to it and taking cholesterol out, helping your HDL particles. HDL generally remove cholesterol from your arterial wall. They hook up, they link up with an LDL, and then they, the LDL delivers it back to the liver for elimination. So let's talk about that process a little bit. How do we eliminate cholesterol? Obviously it ends up in your intestines and that's how you get rid of it. So how does cholesterol end up in your intestines? There's about three different ways that cholesterol ends up in your intestines, and we'll go through this and kind of how, where cholesterol comes from and how it goes. So cholesterol can end up in your intestines from you eating it. When you eat cholesterol, um, there some of it, a lot of it, almost all of it, will end up in your intestines. That's one way that it happens. The second way is your liver making it. Your liver will make cholesterol, dump it into uh, my cells or bile acids or bile salts, and then those, they kind of look like lipoproteins, those end up um, in your intestine. That's the majority of the way. This is, this is your liver making cholesterol. The other way that it gets there is all of the cells in your body making cholesterol, returning it to the liver, and then the liver packaging it up into my cells, which then dump into your intestine. So those are the three ways. You either ate it, your liver made it, or it collected back into your liver from all of the cells in your body. Now, make no mistake, every cell in your body makes its own cholesterol. You do not need to eat cholesterol, you do not need to eat saturated fat to raise your cholesterol. Cholesterol all gets into, all gets made by every cell in your body. You don't need the building blocks. You don't need saturated fat. You don't need cholesterol. You don't need any of that. You just need an acetate and a citrate molecule, which every cell makes. And without cholesterol, cells would not be fluid. Let's say this was a cell. These yellow uh, things on the outside of it in the, in the membrane, these yellow little cholesterols, those are uh, cholesterols that are free cholesterol. Those make the fluid membrane um, more pliable or more flexible, more fluid. And without it, you, we would be dead. So there, without cholesterol, we would be dead. So absolutely, you do need cholesterol. Now, the question is, how much is too much? So over a certain particle or concentration gradient, then it is too much. So most of, like if you look at the guidelines, most of the guidelines say that LDL cholesterol needs to be under 100 milligrams per deciliter for all comers, right? 
We know that when newborns are born, and based on various lab studies and tests and you know multiple results, that somewhere around 20 to 40 is considered physiologic. So above that number, above about 20 or 40, that's when cholesterol starts being deposited into your arteries. Um, and then the, the longer this goes on for many, many decades, the worse the outcomes. That's kind of uh, what happens. Um, and I'll go through a model you know, shortly showing you how that works. So that's what we need to know. LDL needs to be under 100 for the most part. If you have risk factors, like you've, you're a smoker, you're diabetic, you're obese, um, things like that, you want to be under 70 to prevent that from happening because it's worse. We know that a LDL cholesterol above 60, you're probably laying down plaque. Um, for those of you who've had a heart attack or had a stroke or had a cardiovascular event, we want to be under 55. And if you keep having repeat heart attacks and strengths and open heart surgery and other kind of issues, then you probably want to be under 40, according to the European and uh, American guidelines. And that is about what the interpretation is amongst most cardiology societies and uh, groups. So now the next question is, do you need cholesterol to make hormones? A lot of people online will tell you that you need cholesterol to make testosterone and estrogen and progestin and cortisol and all this. First of all, none of that is true. LDL cholesterol is completely unneeded for any of that. Your testicles can make their own hormones. You do not need to help them. You don't need to eat saturated fat. You don't need to eat cholesterol. You don't need any of that. They need a citrate and an acetate and they make all the um, uh, cholesterol that they want. Now, in very rare incidents, these are called steroidogenic uh, tissues, like your ovaries, your adrenals, your testicles. In very rare instances, if an organ like your testicles, for example, or ovaries needed more cholesterol to synthesize hormones, they would actually get it from an HDL particle. HDL uh, using a, um, a receptor called the SRB, SRCB1, it can grab the HDL, bring it in, take its cholesterol, and use that cholesterol. Super rare case, but that would be the case. It would use an HDL, not an LDL. So we can bring people's LDLs down to pretty low, and your testosterone levels would stay pretty high and be almost completely uh, unaffected. So the next question is, what about oxidation? Do we need to check oxidation levels of these? Do we need to know if it's LDL oxidized? So this was something that was back from the 1990s and two, early 2000s where we thought oxidized LDL made a difference. Now, mind you, oxidized LDL, once it's inside the arterial wall, does matter. But oxidized LDL in circulation does not matter. Your liver and your immune system will eliminate it immediately. So the labs noticed that doctors wanted to order these tests or there was some research around it. So labs started offering this test. Doctors ordered it. Turned out to be a nonsense uh, marker. And I'll put all the studies in the links below. So if you want to look at these studies in great detail, you can click on the links below and uh, read these. Um, so that was that. It turns out oxidized LDL is not an issue. Ordering a lab test for oxidized LDL is just going to throw you off and, and it's a bunch of nonsense. So do not do that. It makes absolutely no difference. The next question is, does size matter? There's a lot of these people, and it was based on data and science. We used to think that smaller LDL particles can get into your arterial wall easier and cause more atherosclerosis, which it is actually true. Uh, smaller particles can get in easier, but anything under 70 nanometers can, can get into your arterial wall pretty easily. And these are like 20 maybe 22, 24 at the most, and like 18 to 19 at the least. They're all within that 20 nanometer range, which is well below the 70 threshold. So all of these will get in. Now, I will tell you, larger, more buoyant, um, you know, LDL particles carry more cholesterol. They have more cholesterol inside them, whereas the smaller ones have less cholesterol inside them. So if the bigger ones get in and the little ones get in, the, the bigger ones have more cholesterol inside them per molecule. Like per particle of LDL, there's more cholesterol in the larger ones. So some of these people online say, well, they're large and fluffy. So no one in the scientific community or, or cardiology community describes LDL particles as li large and fluffy. That's just a nonsense term. When you notice somebody calling these large and fluffy, you know they're not scientific or they're just trying to fool you and prey on your insecurities and prey on your lack of knowledge. These are not large and fluffy. They're either more buoyant and less dense, or they are more dense and less buoyant. They're not large, they're not fluffy, they're not small. So ignore all the people that are saying that because they literally have no idea what on earth they're talking about. Now, the next question is, do you need arterial damage? Do you need damage to the arterial wall in order for these things to get in? Well, those studies have been done too. In 1995, Williams and Tabas did a study looking at what if we damage the arterial wall and then look to see if there was any 
atherosclerosis. So it turned out they actually went in and mechanically using like a scraper would scrape the endothelium inside your arteries and see if the atherosclerosis developed there and it did not. Um, so that was thrown out the window. We spent the next 20 years trying to figure out what actually did happen. It turned out you actually needed intact endothelium for atherosclerosis to happen. So while let's say this is the artery, you go in and scratch this area, this area does not end up getting atherosclerosis, but healthy intact endothelium next door did get uh, atherosclerosis. So if we infuse rabbits or humans even with very high levels of LDL cholesterol, you can cause atherosclerosis within hours. They have fatty streaks within hours, but the scratched up or um, damaged endothelium did not. So it was only the intact endothelium that had these issues. And we notice this when we go in and do cardiac catheterizations and we use these very fancy types of imaging techniques called optical coherence tomography or intravascular ultrasound. You can see the actual soft plaque inside of the uh, arteries. Um, so the endothelium has to be completely intact in order for this to happen. So the next question becomes, how do we know it's the LDL? How do we know that LDL cholesterol causes atherosclerosis? So LDL or ApoB specifically, and we'll talk about ApoB and LDL in a second, we know that this happens because Brian Ferentz and his group in 2017, they published an article. They wanted to figure out what criteria needs to be met in order to say with absolute certainty that LDL cholesterol causes atherosclerosis. Not that we guess, not that it correlates with it, not that it's a maybe. They said here is a very strict criteria. When we look at all types of studies, when we look at all types of data, when we look at all types of anything, how can we know with absolute certainty that LDL cholesterol actually is the causal agent for atherosclerosis? And Tobias and, and Williams again prove this because of retention. The arteries have the ability to retain LDL cholesterol, and then these you know open up, dump their cholesterol, and start destroying your arteries from the inside out. So Brian Ferentz and his group wanted to look at what is all the criteria that needs to be met, and they came up with a plan of here's all the things that need to happen in order for us to say LDL cholesterol absolutely causes atherosclerosis. And they went through bit by bit by bit and they looked at Mendelian randomization trials where these are people that are randomized at birth. Some people have genetics that give them very high LDL cholesterol. Some people have genetics that give them very, very low uh, cholesterol like PCSK9, loss of function genes at the bottom here where you have like a, you run around the cholesterol of like LDL cholesterol like 10, 15, maybe 20 for the rest of your life. And people at the higher end where they have an LDL receptor mutation, familial hypercholesterolemia, and other mutations that have cholesterols of like 5, 6, 700 sometimes. So those were one of the ways that they looked at. They looked at randomized control trials where we gave people an intervention uh, to see what would happen if we lowered their cholesterol and followed them for years. We looked at cohort studies. We looked at, you know, all these other ways of trying to figure out, does this thing cause atherosclerosis yes this you know magical you know ball here does this cause atherosclerosis and the final conclusion was that with absolute certainty without question if you have too much of this you will get atherosclerosis it is the causative agent um, in atherosclerosis so let me just show you the model uh, that i was talking about and how it happens and why calcium scoring and ct angiograms um, generally do not give us the answer that we want. Because a lot of people say, well, my calcium score is zero. Even though my LDL is 300, it's way up here. My calcium score is zero. Isn't that okay? Like, should that should I be fine? Aren't I fine? I've been eating, you know, a horrible diet full of saturated fat for the last three years, 10 years, whatever, but my calcium score is zero. Am I okay? So let me show you that model and I'll explain to you why that is not okay. This is a model of what happens to your arteries. Over here on this end is the fully clean, normal artery. You can see the endothelium. Um, it's very, very clean. You could drive a uh, truck through it. You start to get to medium range and late stage and end stage atherosclerosis. At this point, it's starting to get narrow. You no longer can pass my finger through it, whereas at the beginning here, you can put it all in there. The arterial wall remodels this way. It starts happening on the outside of the wall. Very rarely does it encroach on the lumen. This is the lumen. When we inject dye into here, like with a cardiac catheterization or a CT angiogram, you see inside here. You do not see inside the walls. It's very hard to see inside the walls. Calcium happens inside the walls. Somewhere around here in this range is when you start having calcium plaque and calcium buildup. 
So when somebody says my calcium score is zero, they have really late stage disease. They are like um, right here on this end. This is where you start seeing calcium somewhere in this transition zone. And it still is not encroaching on the lumen. You can inject dye, whether via cardiac catheterization or CT angiogram, and still they can tell you, oh, your arteries are wide open. Your arteries are clear. There's no plaque. There's no calcium. There's no this. There's not. So first of all, CT scans and CT uh, cardiac angiograms, like when I go into your arteries and inject dye into your arteries, we will not see soft plaque that is in the wall because we are injecting the, the dye into this area here. The dye flows through here and we get a crystal clear picture that your arteries are wide open. It does not show all of this soft plaque that is building up inside of your arteries, unfortunately. So a lot of people who are like, oh, my calcium score is zero or whatever have you it is. We know that that's not true and that it's not protective. So how do we know that you have soft plaque? If your LDL cholesterol is really high, you have soft plaque. If you look at the PISA trial, the PESA, Prevention of Early Subclinical Atherosclerosis, they did very, very fancy imaging where they looked at people's arteries to try to determine if they have atherosclerosis long before it, it blocks the lumen and long before it actually is symptomatic. They looked at young people with no calciums, no obesity, no insulin resistance, very um, good BMI, not obese, non-smokers, all of that, very healthy young people. They found that people with a pretty normal LDL, or at least what we used to consider normal, 110, they had a 45%, 45% of people with an LDL of 110, 110 milligrams per deciliter, had atherosclerosis, subclinical atherosclerosis. If you increase that number to 130, which previously that 130 was the upper limit of normal before 2018 when we changed it, 55% of those people had subclinical atherosclerosis. If you went up to 150, add another 20. 68% or almost 70% of people had atherosclerosis in these young, healthy individuals that are not smokers, not obese, not overweight, not diabetic, not calcium you know, scored, none of that. They all had atherosclerosis. Not only that, what was even more profound is 63% of them had atherosclerosis in more than one arterial bed. So they had it in their carotids plus their femoral. They had it in their coronaries plus their femorals, plus their aorta, plus their whatever, whatever they can measure. So there's a few other trials that are very, uh, that looked at these same kind of individuals. There's one called the CARDIA trial, C-A-R-D-I-A. -A. They also looked at super young individuals. This is about 5,100 young males, ages 18 to 30. And all they did was, strat and they were also young, healthy, normal BMI, non-smokers, non-diabetic, all of that. They're, they obviously, there were some people overweight and some smokers and some people that were diabetic, but it was very low numbers, like less than eight, nine, 10%. They looked at those people and they found that the time to first event was predicted only by LDL cholesterol. So the higher the LDL cholesterol, the sooner you had your first event, event meaning like heart attack or stroke. So very, very important here. They also found that if this was low, if your LDL cholesterol was low, your time to first event was actually negative rather than having your first event based on the data, based on the prediction models of 15 years, it was actually negative. You had it in, you know, didn't have one or added another 10, 15 years of event-free time. Um, so that was another study. A new one called the PreCAD trial went back and looked at the PISA cohort, did some fancy imaging as well, and they wanted to see how much we could regress plaques by lowering LDL. And they did like six-year intervals, and they found that the young people who lowered their LDL regressed their plaque burden pretty significantly. I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but I'll link all those studies down here pretty significantly just by lowering LDL cholesterol. No other factors really made a difference. Now, if you like this kind of talk or this kind of topic, I have a new cholesterol book coming out. It's actually called Cholesterol Truths. Um, it should be coming out soon. If you go to drallo.net slash cholesterol, depending on when you click on this video or watch it, you'll either figure out how to pre-order the book, how to get on the waiting list to find out when it's gonna be released. We are like this close to releasing it. Got some pretty big names in the cardiology world. The president of the National Atherosclerotic Society, the European Atherosclerotic Society, the top educator in lipids and lipid metabolism, Dr. Thomas Dayspring uh, is on the book as a co-editor actually. We've got Lane Norton, we've got Dr. Patty Barrett, we've got uh, Alan Aragon, um, just Simon Hill, even lots of these, you know, people who are super evidence based, Matthew Nagra, um, I'm sure I'm forgetting some people, Terry Simpson, uh, Matthew Phillips, all of these physicians, cardiologists, people in the healthcare, nutritionists, you know, people with PhDs and all of these sciences, all on board supporting this book and endorsing it heavily. 
So I highly recommend go to drhallow.net slash cholesterol. You can grab Cholesterol Truth, find out when it's coming out, when you can order it. And I hope to see you in the next episode. If you have questions, drop them below. I answer almost every single question.